you that you are a God who has always been generous to your people. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we've been going through the book of Joshua, we've been talking about courage, on why we have courage, and how to be a people of courage. And um, it's because of our Lord God. It's He's the one who gives us courage. We've come to a place in our story where the people are now, for the first time, entering into the promised land. They're crossing the Jordan, and God is actually drying up the water in the, in the Jordan so that they can walk across on dry ground. And this is a monumental moment because this was a promise that was given that would happen to to Abraham's descendants well over 400 years ago. They've already spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt. And so you can imagine like like Canada hasn't even been around for 400 years. So just put that into perspective when you're thinking about how long ago this promise was given to Abraham. And so now this is a, a, a pinnacle point. Like even, even when the people first came to the edge of the promised land and chose not to go in, God was not stopped or deterred from making sure that that would occur. God made a promise to Abraham that this was going to happen, and it's going to happen. And it takes place in Joshua 4, and it, it describes it like this. He said to the Israelites, in the future, your descendants are going to ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? And this situation is where they walk now through the, the Jordan, and God says to the, to the Levites who are standing there with the Ark of the Covenant, make sure one person or, or one stone comes for each tribe, and you take it from the middle of the Jordan, and you're going to bring it, and you're going to set it up. And he says, this is the reason why you're doing this, is so that you will remember these stones. So when, so when your children come and say, what do these stones mean? Tell them this. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea. So remember, he dried up the Red Sea. He has now done this for the next generation. He has done this. He's dried up the Jordan before them, before us, until we had crossed over. And then he explains why he did this. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. There was a purpose of why they would set up these stones. At, in our lives, we, we establish certain things as reminders of what God has done for us. Sometimes we might wear a cross around our neck, and when our children ask, what is the cross for, we can explain to them what God has done for me. Sometimes you might have a picture or, or something like a scripture verse that you hang on your wall in your house as a reminder of what God has done for you. So we understand what this means about talking about God's faithfulness to the next generation. And the purpose of that is so that we are reminded that our God, and a, a proclamation to the rest of the world, that our God is a mighty God, right? And that we should fear Him always because of His power and His might. There is a purpose behind that. And part of what Joshua is doing is here is he's trying to remind the people, as the book of Joshua plays out, he's trying to remind the people of what God has done and God is sovereign over all of those things. Even from the place where he dries up the Jordan River to the place where he brings down the walls of Jericho, when he, he goes after the Amorites with the hailstones, when he does all of the, um, when he drives out the great nations before them, God is doing all these things to show that he is sovereign and that he is going to make sure that his covenant comes to fruition. And in Joshua 5.1, it describes this, and now then, all the Amorite kings, all the kings in that area, west of the Jordan, and all the Canaanite kings across the coast heard how God had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over. And what happened is all of their hearts melted and they no longer had courage to face the Israelites. God is already, at this moment, establishing it so that the Israelites are going to be able to go into the land, and he's going to be able to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. So, how many of you now know what happens next? Do they automatically run into Jericho and take it over? It seems like the next thing that you would do is like once you enter the land, you're going to run forward and you're going to start fighting because God has commanded you to do this. But God actually at this moment, he pauses the people. He pauses them for a purpose, to remind them of something. He wants them to be reminded of the promise that he made to Abraham over 400 years ago. 
Here was the promise that he made to Abraham. If you go back in the book of Genesis, you'll hear this promise. The promise is God takes Abraham out, makes him look at the stars, and he says, Abraham, I am going to give you enough descendants that they're going to outnumber the number of stars in the sky and the number of grains of sand upon the seashore. And I am going to bring you back, I'm going to bring your descendants back to this land of Canaan, and this will become their property. This will be the promise that he makes for him. And God makes that promise, and then he makes a covenant with Abraham. A covenant is not just a contract. It's a covenant. A covenant is something that is done in permanency. So it's something that is permanent. It's not something that you can break. So God does not break the covenant. And so to prove the covenant, what they do is they take a heifer. He gets Abraham to cut the heifer in half, and God, in the, in the form of fire or like a torch, actually goes in between the two parts of the heifer. And the idea is that blood is spilt, a sacrifice is made, and the promise is given. And God says, I'm going to give you a sign that this is going to happen, and a sign for, you, for my people to continue to do. So what is the sign that God gives Abraham that you are now part of the people and you now are part of this covenant and this covenant is going to be true. What does God then ask Abraham to do? Does anyone remember? Isaac's no. Good. Not, not, I, at that moment, the sign of the covenant that God gives at that point is circumcision. The word circumcision is to cut. The, the word covenant is to cut. The sign that they are the Jewish people, the Israelites, is the fact that their males are circumcised. So here they come across into the Jordan, into the promised land, and here they are, and God says, hold on a second, before we go any further, there's something that we have to take care of. And here's what happened. When they came out of, the, out of Egypt, the people had stopped doing the Passover when they were in Egypt. The people had not continued on with the covenant of circumcision. They had not remembered the covenant of Abraham. If you remember, there's that little story about how Moses' sons need to be circumcised. And Moses is actually, his life is at risk because he hadn't circumcised his sons up to that point. Right after that, the people then are circumcised and they celebrate the Passover meal. When that happens, they now go into the desert. And if you remember, they get to the edge of the promised land. As they get to the edge of the promised land in Kadesh Barnea, what ends up happening is they chicken out, right? They send in the 10 tribes. They have no faith. They send, sorry, they send in the 10, um, sorry, they send in the 12 um, spies. 10 of them say, we can't go in there. Only two of them say, we can. Who are the two? Joshua and Caleb. So now we have Joshua here again. But what's happened up to this point is that they have not been circumcising their children, and they have not been teaching the covenant. So this is what God says in Joshua, two, Joshua 5, 2 to 9. At this time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gabeth Harloth. Now, when he says circumcise them again, he doesn't mean like a second time, because you can't do it a second time. <laughs> now... This is why he did it. This is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of the military age, died in the desert on their way after leaving Egypt. All the people who had come, who had come, who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not, right? So all the men had been circumcised then, but those who were born in Egypt had not. So if you remember, God says to them, you can't enter into the promised land. I'm going to give this to your children because you did not trust me. At that time, they wanted to stone Caleb. They wanted to stone Joshua. They said, let's make another leader, get rid of Moses, and we're going to go back to Egypt because things were better then. And that's when God says, guess what? You're not going into this promised land. So the Israelites had moved about in the desert for 40 years until all the men of military age when they had left Egypt died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their, fa for their fathers to give us, a land flowing of milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. Right? So he's circumcising their children because that whole generation had died except for Joshua and Caleb. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. 
And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place that has been called Gilgal to this day. The word Gilgal means to roll, right? So he's rolling away the reproach that they have that's against them from the time that they were slaves. So they were slaves. They've wandered in the desert for 40 years because they were not faithful to God. And now they have finally crossed over the Jordan. The next generation is the one who's going to receive the promise because they had not been willing to follow after God. And so God is now reestablishing the covenant that he had made with Abraham. He is reestablishing this covenant for this people that he will be their God and they will be his people. So in light of this, what we're seeing here is that there had been no Passover up until this point. Like they had had the Passover, they weren't celebrating it because it says in scripture, if you're not circumcised, you're not supposed to celebrate the Passover, right? So now the people are circumcised and they celebrate the Passover. They have now reestablished this covenant with God that he is going to give them the promised land. They have taken this time to celebrate something and God has brought them into this idea that what they're about to go through is not just a physical thing that they're going to, but there is a spiritual thing that they've gone. They've prepared themselves for the battles that are now ahead of them. So the question is, when that covenant is originally broken, when all the people now have been circumcised after they had journeyed out of Egypt, when the covenant that had once been broken and they had not followed it, they are now following it after God. God has set up for them these stones. He has set up for them circumcision, that the sign of circumcision is showing that he has people now who are moving into the promised land. God is not just wasting their time, but he's actually proving to them that, he, that they belong to him, that he has rolled away their reproach that they had in Egypt. The question now is, as they are about to enter in and they are about to fight, what does this have to do with us? Like, what does that mean for you and I? Is there anything that we can look at this passage and go, boy, this has something to do with us today? The answer is actually yes, very much so. Very much so it has something to do with us. And so I'm going to take you through a scripture passage that I want you to think about it from this regard. It has to do with something of a mortification that happens to us when we become Christians. Right? So there's a mortification that happens when they become Israelites. But what actually is a true Israel? Is it someone who has been circumcised by the flesh? Is it only that? Is that, was, is that the reason why God gives the sign? Is, is he gives the sign of circumcision for the purpose of just saying, oh, well, now I know I belong to a people and now I have a sign? Like, the men would remember that quite frequently. But there's a purpose behind this, right? It's not just a circumcision of the flesh. There's something else that goes on here. Paul describes it like this for you and I as Christians. And this goes back to the idea that our God is a covenant God. Did you know that our God works in covenants? He gave Abraham the covenant. He gives the covenant to the people at Mount Sinai where he writes the Ten Commandments and he says, I'm going to be your God and you be my people. How long did that last? Probably all of about a few days and then they're worshiping a gold. They have this inability to continue to keep the covenant of God. And so now God's like, okay, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve this problem. And he does this in a very specific way. And this is how he solves this problem for you and I, is he makes a new covenant. It's not like the old covenant, and he makes the new covenant. And the new covenant carries along with it circumcision, but not the way that it is in the Old Testament. This is what he says in Colossians 2, 10, and 11. You have been given the fullness in Christ. So he's speaking to the church in Coloss. He's speaking to the church. We belong to the church. He's speaking to us. You, who are Christians, have been given the fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Who has all power and authority? Christ does, right? Over all power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised. Some of you are like, mm, I don't remember that happening. And this is what he goes on to say. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature. When you become a Christian, he cuts off the nature in you, which is sinful, right? He's putting off the sinful nature. It is not a circumcision that is done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision that is done by who? 
It is done by Christ. Well, how does Christ cut off our sinful nature? How does he do that? If Christ is the one who is circumcising us, there is something that, this mortification that happens, there is this cutting that takes place. And when we talk about this, he goes on and describes this in the next verse, verse 12. He says this, having been baptized with him, with Christ, in baptism, and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. So we're talking about having been baptized with Christ and raised, we're talking about resurrection with Christ, but through your faith in the power of God. So your belief that God can actually raise you from the dead, right? And what we're talking about here is the gospel, right? So here is the gospel proclaimed. Having been done that through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. When you were then cut, you were then made alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations, right? Having canceled the law with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. And he took those away. And what did he do? He nailed them to the cross. That's the gospel. If you're ever looking for a short version of what the gospel is, there is this direct connection between this cutting that takes place, this cutting that takes place, and then this removing of the sin that occurs, the sinful nature that's in you, and doing something else for you. And then he describes this in Romans 2, 28 and 29. A man then, or a person, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, right? So you're not a Jew if only you've been circumcised outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. And this is what Paul is trying to get to us. It's not only a physical act that is done. No, a man is truly a Jew or an, a true Israelite, right, if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is a circumcision of the heart. The circumcision that Jesus does for us when he cuts off our sinful nature is a circumcision of the heart. How is it done? It is by, done by the Holy Spirit, not the law, not the written code. It is done by grace. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Let me ask you this. Do you know what it means to be cut to the heart? We use that term, right? I've been cut to the heart. That is the idea behind the circumcision of the heart. Do you remember when you were not a Christian? Do you remember the first time that God cut your heart? It is a cutting of repentance. It is a cutting that leads you to repentance. It is the first time where you look upon Christ at the cross and you recognize that I am connected to Christ through his death and resurrection. That it is because of my sin that Christ, the Son of God, the perfect, holy Lamb of God, had to die because of the things that I did. There is a cutting of the heart that goes on there. There is true repentance that happens in a person that is done by the Spirit, not by the law. The law shows you that you're a sinner, but the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you and regenerates you. The regeneration that ends up happening here is this idea. The circumcision, Jeremiah 4, 4, talks about this. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you men of Judah and you people of Jerusalem. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no, burn with no one to quench it. So what he's saying here is, even in the Old Testament, the idea of circumcision was meant to be a circumcision of the heart. Deuteronomy 10, 16 also says this, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Do you remember when you were stiff-necked? Do you remember when the things of the Lord were not important to you? Do you remember when you concerned yourself only with your things? Do you remember when God cut you and he made you believe? This is the promise that the Old Testament talks about, that there's going to be this time of a new covenant. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. This cutting that takes place, there's two things that happen. God takes away your heart of stone, and he gives you a heart of flesh. He gives you his Holy Spirit. Because in the Old Testament, they're unable to keep the covenant of God. They're unable to keep the law. And the reason why they're unable to keep the law is because they don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. And when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. God circumcises from you this this sin that is in your life. And so as a Christian, every day we get up and we kill sin because if you don't kill sin, sin will kill you, right? And the power to be able to do that happens because the Holy Spirit now dwells in us. And because the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, you and I here at this moment have received the Spirit in our lives. You and I at this moment are now seen as righteous before God because God has done that act for us in the fact that he circumcised your heart. So... When we look at what is going on here in the, with, the, with the Israelites coming across the Jordan, there is a great foreshadowing that happens in our lives. There is a great foreshadowing to what Christ is about to do for us and to take place. Think about this for a moment. They come 400 years in slavery. You, how many years were you a slave to your sin? After 400 years of slavery, the people come out into the promise, I mean, come out into the desert, and they go through this time, and God circumcises their, them at that moment. We, too, are circumcised. There is a moment where we become God's people, and he becomes our God. And at that moment, when we come out, and we come to this point where we are walking as lost in the desert, we are brought by our Joshua. Right? Our Jesus, is his name is Joshua. We are brought by Joshua to the edge of the promised land. And at this moment, you now get an opportunity. Do I go with God's people through the waters of baptism, through the Jordan, through the Red Sea, but now through the Jordan? Do I go through with God's people through the waters of baptism? Do I make a proclamation that I am going to make a new covenant with God? Am I going to be part of this new family of God? Am I going to enter into this promised land? Am I going to believe what Christ tells us? Because every single time we gather here before the Lord's table and I hold up the cup, do you remember what we say? This is a new covenant, a new cutting, a new covenant done by what? In the blood of Christ, which is poured out for what? For the forgiveness of of your sin. And through that, what is always, or, or do this only for the sake of the Israelites, he is talking to you and I. He's foreshadowing a time when we will come from out of slavery. You're like, I was never a slave. You were a slave to your sin. We are now still slaves, but we're slaves to righteousness. We're slaves to Christ. Right? We're still slaves, but we're slaves to that which is who's God, who is the great one who we want to be slaves and servants to. And when we come out of there and he brings us into the promised land, he is our king and we belong to him. So I'm going to ask you this and I'll leave you with this today. If you have never had your heart cut by God, you're going to have a hard time even knowing what I'm talking about. But if you've never had that, what it means is where you are stiff-necked and it means you still have a heart of stone. It means that you have no love for Christ in your life, you have no love for God, and you love yourself and you love this world. That's the difference between having your heart cut and not having your heart cut. You can choose to continue to stay that way. Like if you want to stay there, you can stay there. But the invitation to come into a new covenant with God through the pouring out of the spilling of the blood of Christ is that when I look upon that cross, when I see that cross, it reminds me of something. It reminds me that I once had a heart of stone, that I once did not love Christ. But it also reminds me that it is my sin that caused the Son of God to have to die on the cross. And when I see the fact that God has loved me that much, it should move me to the point 
where I now look at the cross and I remember what God has done for me. And if I have never known love, that should take my heart of stone and melt it to the place where I now have a heart of flesh. If you have never come to that point, maybe today is that opportunity. You pray and you ask God to get rid of your stiff neck. You ask God to have mercy on you, to come to terms with the fact that it was my sin that caused God's son to have to die. It was my sin that caused for God's son to have to suffer. It was my sin that caused it so that I might know that God is glorious and gracious and kind and merciful. But the only thing that I contribute to that is the fact that I have sinned against him. But the good news is this, that I, having been buried in baptism and raised with him through the power of faith in the power of God and who, who raised him from the dead, where once we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of our sinful nature, God did this for me. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its reg regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. And he took it away. And what did he do with it? He nailed it to that cross. Amen. Father, when we come before you, we recognize that we are sinners. Lord, when we come before you, we recognize that we have a sinful nature compared to you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would circumcise our hearts, that you would take away our stiff necks and our hearts of stone, and that you might give us hearts of flesh. Father, where once we were slaves, you have freed us from that slavery of sin. And you have made us righteous in Jesus Christ. And so if there's someone among us today, Lord, who does not know what it means to be cut to the heart, who has no desire for you or devotion or love for you, then Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do a miracle today. Lord, we pray that you will save them, that you will regenerate them, that you will do the miracle that you have said that you can do, which is to give them a heart of flesh that you would cut them deeply. And Lord, if there is even someone here who has forgotten what it means to be cut to the heart, or we have just taken for granted the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross for us, then Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for that. That we would once again be renewed and reminded of what it was like to live life without you. That we too would be cut. That we would be cut deep. That our love for you would be renewed and repassioned and that we would love you more and more. We pray this in Christ's name.